Aristotle said, friends are another self. And that actually proves to be true. Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today, we welcome Eric Barker on the show. Eric is the author of the Wall Street Journal bestseller, Barking Up the Wrong Tree. His book has sold over half a million copies and has been translated into 19 languages. It was even the subject of a question on Jeopardy. Eric is also a sought-after speaker, having given talks at MIT, the Aspen Ideas Festival, Google, the United States Military Central Command, and the Olympic Training Center. His newest book is called Please Well with Others. In this episode, I talk to Eric about relationships. We tackle the misconceptions on loneliness, marriage, and body language. Eric shares practical tips that we can apply in our own relationships, such as how to keep passionate love alive and how to catch liars. We also touch on the topics of communication, vulnerability, community, and health. It's always a great time chatting with Eric. He's a very thoughtful guy who knows a lot about psychology. So it's my great pleasure to bring you Eric Barker. Hey, Eric. How you doing, man? I'm okay. I'm okay. You and I haven't had an extended conversation maybe since the last podcast. <laughs> How many years ago was that? Five, five years. My first book was 2017. Well, how much have you changed since five years ago? Like, uh, how has your thinking about human nature changed? It's an interesting five years to pick because of the, the pandemic. But the funny thing is that, like, well, funny but sad is, like, I decided my second book was going to be on relationships and, mm-hmm. you know, put everything together. So, and then literally two weeks after we closed the deal, California locked down for the pandemic. And all of a sudden, the issue of relationships, connection, all of a sudden, it went from this project I was working on to something that was very serious that was you know, going to be a big deal in people's lives. So if, if any of my thoughts have changed on human nature and stuff, it's, it's you know, only reinforced the issue of, of connection and relationships because, you know, it's, maybe it's availability bias. I don't know. But just, just like seeing all of this and also seeing the reaction of the world and life in terms of the pandemic, I've just realized just even more so how important people are. When did you decide that you wanted to write this book? Was it pre-pandemic or was it during the pandemic? I was putting the proposal together long before. And I started roughing it out probably in 2018, but I didn't take it. I didn't really get taken seriously until 2019. So long, long before COVID reared its ugly head. How was the pandemic? affected you personally very double-edged sword uh you know in in the sense of writing the book you know as well was very productive uh, i didn't have i didn't have a lot of distractions going on but on the other hand i i don't recommend reading studies on the negative effects of distance and loneliness uh while you're cooped up yeah. in a pandemic that's not conducive to uh, to feeling great <laughs> yeah well i like the title of the book play well with others why do you choose that title and how's that germane to some overarching threads that run through the book? I mean, I haven't been great personally. Relationships have never been my strong suit. And I thought it was kind of a relatable maxim we've all heard that we understand. And that personally, I kind of, you know, connected to because, uh, you know, on the big five out of a possible 100 on agreeableness, I scored a four. So wow. um, I don't know what a, what a report card for a, uh, a middle-aged man would look like, but I don't know if I'd, I would have scored so high on plays well with others. That's so interesting because that's not like my perception of you when I talk to you. Um, so, but maybe if I got to know you better. <laughs> but but uh, when you say relationships, you're referring to not just romantic relationships. You're saying your own life, even with like friends like has this have there been issues for you throughout your life you said you don't do that well with relationships like what does that mean i'm not really a joiner that's not never been the focus for me yeah you know and in in some ways that's been a positive in the sense of redirecting time and energy towards other things but it never came easy to me it was never kind of number one for me and you know and i struggled because i didn't i didn't understand it you never, you never have access to other people's minds. You, you never kind of know what the baseline is. You just have this distance where you realize other people seem to be handling this very differently and I'm not. And what's something's going on here. So the book was to, I mean, I took the same, I took the same structure basically that I used for the first book, which was the maxims of success, trying to apply the social science and say, does this hold up? Playing Mythbusters. And, you know, second book, same thing, but it was all about relationships and just trying to, you know, 
get to it, get to the fundamentals, like does love conquer all, is a friend in need, a friend indeed, you know, is no man an island, you know, and trying to understand that. And, you know, I think I found some things that are helpful to other people, but definitely found some things that helped elucidate things for me. Love it. I love it. You do debunk a lot of myths in this book. So maybe like that's a great superpower of yours. What is one myth about relationships that we could start off with that you debunk in this book? One thing that really blew me away was the issue around loneliness and, you know, looking at Cacioppo's work and yeah, seeing it. that he, yeah, he just found that lonely people on average don't spend any less time with others than non-lonely people do. Mm -hmm. And I think that's shocking. I think most people would knee jerk disagree with that. And yet, if you think about it, you know, we've all felt lonely in a crowd. You know, it's like just because you're in the middle of Times Square on New Year's Eve doesn't mean that you feel connected to those people or close to those people. And when you get to the core of it, you know, proximity, you know, is not really the issue. As Cacioppo basically said, to paraphrase, you know, loneliness is how you feel about your relationships and that perception of it. Because, you know, you have the flip side. It's like you look at, you know, Vivek Murthy says that, you know, solitude is protective against loneliness. And ostensibly, those two are the same thing. You're not proximate to other people. Yet one is protective and the other is correlated with pretty much every negative health metric you can imagine. And it's an issue of perception. I don't, I don't mean to diminish it by saying that. I just mean it's that issue of do you feel you have strong connections to others? If you do, you can go on a business trip, be away from friends and family and feel fun. You'll miss them, but you don't feel like horrible loneliness. Meanwhile, you can be in Times Square on New Year's Eve be surrounded by people and feel like no one understands you. So it's that issue of do you feel those connections are strong? And I think we I think most people, including myself, uh, feel like, you know, oh, I just need to spend more time with other people. It's like, no, you probably need to deepen your connections with other people. Carl Rogers talked about uh, different forms of loneliness. And one of his forms was uh, he called it, uh, I think, he called it existential loneliness, which is how disconnected are you from yourself? So I, I wonder to what extent do people crave relationships to fulfill a hole in their soul because they really feel they don't feel comfortable with themselves. They like need someone else to be with someone else to distract them from themselves. Am I getting too existential here? <laughs> I think that cuts to the qu quick of it. I remember when I first when I first interviewed Arthur Aaron, yes. he said something about fixing love relationships that you know, reading all this Gottman stuff, and which is awesome. Arthur Aaron was like, oh, well, the first thing you need to deal with is yourself. And it's so obvious in a way, but it doesn't really get discussed quite enough or at least as deeply because it's like, if you don't feel comfortable with yourself, then it's like, yeah, you're having relationship problems. It's like you're 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 patient zero. <laughs> you, know I mean? you know, you're you're the one going around and you know, potentially possibly causing the problems. So if you're not first, you know, addressing those issues, then the only possible solution would be to find someone who compensates for all of all of those issues. And and that's not going to be fair or healthy. So, no, I totally agree with you. I think, like, first and foremost, if you're dealing with serious issues around yourself, yeah, you have to resolve that before you're before you're going to to have, you know, really good relationships with other people. And so many of, of the findings you talk about in your book, so interesting. You talk about if you're about to walk down the aisle, you better be feeling crazy in love. Um, and this is a study I hadn't, I wasn't familiar with, but said women who have second thoughts before they say I do are two and a half times more likely to be divorced in four years. For men, it's more than a 50% increase. Holy cow. I mean, if that's the case, how many people really are that crazy in love when they're about to get married? I'm, what's the statistics on that? What percentage of people are actually crazy in love? I don't know what percentage of people are, are crazy in love, but I mean, no, I think you're right. And I think that speaks to some of the other stuff I discussed in the book was the issue of, you know, marriage is in a difficult situation right now. We don't have the so social and cultural pressures that we used to do, which is fantastic in a lot of ways. You, you took the governor off the engine. You know, it's like, that's great. So if you're willing to do the work, and this is most, this is from Eli Finkel, you know, it's like, if you're willing to do the work and really craft and customize a great relationship, it's phenomenal. It's the best thing in the world. It's the do it yourself. It's a custom tailored but if we don't do the work, we don't have those societal and cultural pressures, norms and strictures to keep everything within bounds. 
we have tremendous freedom, which is great if you're willing to, to do the work. But we, the defaults aren't, and the averages are not as safe as, as they used to be because we, we kind of removed uh, those, those pressures. So it's a tricky balance. And that's what Finkel found was that, you know, the people, the happiest marriages right now are, ha- are the happiest marriages that have ever existed. Meanwhile, the bottom end is not good at all. The average is not as good. But the real critical factor here that doesn't show up as immediate, immediately in quick analysis of the data, one of the big things is people just aren't getting married. So a lot of things are skewed, is a lot of people are, are opting out of the system, which again, might, might be the best thing for them, but it still shows that we have a lot of, of myths and skewed perspectives on marriage, the place of marriage, and how it's gonna, how it's end, how it's gonna end up. Yeah, we sure as heck do. Are you married, Eric? <laughs> no. no. <laughs> okay. You know, John Gottman's seminal research is 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 mind blowing. You know, the, the extent to which he can predict uh, whether or not people are going to stay together after watching videos and coding their responses after three minutes of an interaction with each other. Yeah. You know, the most important factors he's discovered that um, will predict. Uh, a healthy marriage. First and foremost, he talks about his four horsemen. First and foremost, a lot of people are afraid of having, you know, marital disputes because they think it's it's going to go badly. We're going to argue and we're going to get divorced. And yet, you know, what Gottman found was that yelling and screaming only lead to divorce. That's only 40% of the time. More importantly, it's usually an issue of not communicating. You know, it's not talking about those things. Then we're only having a conversation with ourselves that most marriages don't end with yelling and screaming. You yell and scream when you care. You know, is that most couples split because they started living parallel lives. So you have to talk. And then in terms of talking, you know, he sees four critical things, four critical mistakes that are highly correlated, I think like 85% with divorce. And that's uh, criticism, stonewalling, defensiveness, and contempt. And criticism is the issue of complaining is good. Complaining raises issues. You raise them, you can solve them. Criticism is when you make it the you make it about the other person's character, not their actions. And that doesn't go nearly as well when you start attacking the other person's character. Stonewalling is when you shut down in response to issues that your your partner raises. And it's basically a passive form of being dismissive. You know, and defensiveness is they raise an issue and then you fire back and it just keeps escalating, which obviously isn't good. And then contempt is when you see your partner on a lower plane than yourself. Gottman describes it as sulfuric acid for love, and it is the single biggest, you know, predictor of divorce. But the flip side that I would say is that's the negative. Avoiding those negatives is good, but avoiding negatives, we generally focus too much on that. You know, it's like that you know, potentially could just get you to neutral and neutral isn't love. What Gottman talks about, like you said, about the being able to predict the success of a relationship and predict divorce, that comes down to the story. And it's really about kind of that, that aspect of embracing the negatives, you know, seeing it towards this, like, hey, we had problems, but we got over them. That sort of embracing the negative, overcoming it, you know, that's that critical aspect that he looks for in a story that allows him to predict, you know, whether a couple will be divorced in five years. So many um, marital problems don't get resolved. Another big part of that, that research is showing that kind of the manner in which people try to resolve things it really matters a lot, not necessarily the contents of the conflict. Can you kind of elaborate a little bit more on what I'm talking about? Gottman found that 69% of ongoing marital issues never get resolved. And I think a lot of people immediately feel like that's depressing and that's negative, but I don't think that's the best way to look at it. The, the best way to look at it is to realize that that 69% is true of unhappy couples and true of happy couples, that you're always going to have issues and some of them aren't going to get resolved. And that does not predict necessarily the success of the union. So we have to resolve this. We have to settle this. That's a dangerous perspective. You know, to paraphrase Gottman, he put it really well, is it's not about the resolution of conflict. It's about the regulation of conflict to discuss it, to talk with your partner, to understand, because it might be just a different perspective. Something that's very important to them might not be as important to you and vice versa. And if you don't talk, those things can be very idiosyncratic and non-intuitive. If you don't talk, you can't find those. And there might be a way to honor both of your perspectives, you know, or to deal with it. But it's it's less about like trying to just kill problems dead so they never pop up again. And it's more about 
trying to find a way where both of your values can get respected, can get understood, you know, pl- playing fair, you know, in terms of that, the regulation of conflict, not the resolution of conflict. I mean, that's kind of a game changer to think like it, it's, it's kind of analogous to life in general. The point is yeah. the point of life to resolve all your conflicts or is it the journey? You know, is it like the meaning you find through trying to reconcile the conflicts seems to be, uh, well, that's more meaningful than, than just resolving them all. Yeah. What about the, you know, the fact that passion fades very quickly in a marriage, some marriages more quickly than others, but, um, what, what about, uh, people who want to keep love alive? What does the research show on, on that? I mean, what's, really critical there is just that understanding that the crazy love typically dies down about, you know, 18 months. It's tricky because we associate that with marriage and love and this, you know, overwhelming. And usually that dies down. It usually moves towards a more companionate love. And as Gottman finds, you know, it is actually the, what predicts a successful marriage over the long haul is usually much more about the friendship aspects of marriage than the insane, passionate love. But we can keep some of that alive. It's just that we, we there's a bit of a bait and switch in there in that love is very passive, you know, in the sense that those feelings just hit you. you those feelings rise up. That passionate love, you know, is not a choice. It, it just occurs, but it does die down. However, you know, if you think about the principle, which I know you're familiar with, of emotional contagion, that whichever situation we're in, we tend to associate those feelings with the person that we're with. We can leverage that to try and keep the ball in the air, volleyball wise, with those positive emotions, where rather than just having another night of Netflix and pizza, to go out, do fun things, put yourself in exciting, fun environment. There was one study where they compared it you know, two cohorts, one went on quote unquote pleasant dates and the other went on exciting dates and exciting one hands down, you know, adrenaline makes the heart grow fonder. You know, it's like to, to keep that stimulation alive, we will come to associate those exciting feelings with our partner and we can keep those kind of like positive, very early love emotions going. But again, it shifts to it's on us. We have to be a little bit more deliberate about it. The trauma, loss, and uncertainty of our world have led many of us to ask life's biggest questions, such as who are we? What is our highest purpose? And how do we not only live through, but thrive in the wake of tragedy, division, and challenges to our fundamental way of living? To help us all address these questions, process what this unique time in human history has meant for us personally and collectively, and emerge whole, I've collaborated with my colleague and dear friend, Dr. Jordan Feingold, MD, to bring you our forthcoming book. It's called Choose Growth a workbook for transcending trauma, fear, and self-doubt. It's a workbook designed to guide you on a journey of committing to growth and the pursuit of self-actualization every day. It's chock full of research from humanistic psychology, positive psychology, developmental psychology, personality psychology, cognitive science, and neuropsychology. So lots of themes that you hear about on this podcast. And it's aimed to help us all integrate the many facets of ourselves and co-create our new normal with a renewed sense of strength, vitality, and hope. Whether you're healing from loss, adapting to the new normal, or simply looking ahead to life's next chapter, Choose Growth will help steer you there to deeper connection to your values, your life vision, and ultimately your most authentic self. Choose Growth will officially hit the shelves September 13th, and you can pre-order your copy or the audiobook in the U.S. now on Amazon, Barnes & Noble, IndieBound, and all major retailers. If you're in the U.K. and Commonwealth, you can pre-order now at bookshop.org.uk. We truly hope this book helps you grow and thrive and become your best self. Okay, now back to the show. Before we, we shift to the friendship segment of our chat, what else within the romantic relationships um, have I kind of left out that uh, would be really big ones for our listeners to, to help them? I mean, one of the biggest that I, that I found that I think can have a huge impact was uh, Gottman's incredible work. He found that just by listening to the first three minutes of a conversation, he could predict the end of the conversation with over 90% accuracy. And the, the practical takeaway is if it starts harsh, it's going to end harsh. If you start relationship discussions with both barrels on the attack, he just found that the vast majority of the time, that's how it's going to end. Versus if we pause, if we take a deep breath, 
Complaining is good. Criticism is bad. We don't make it about the other person. We don't attack their character. We focus on the issue itself. Keep it calm. That has an enormous effect on the end result, the end resolution, and the emotions that people take away. And that's you know another surprising, surprising finding I found is that you know if people think back, usually couples can't remember the substance, the content of the argument, but they remember how they felt. And so, raising issues in a diplomatic way, you know, way produces better emotional endings, and those better emotional endings are are what is remembered over the long haul. I mean, it makes sense when you're in it; it's a little bit harder because, well, ego gets in the way. I mean, isn't isn't ego a big block to to some of these things? I mean, and, and I think that's why keeping those lanes of communication open is really critical. You know, because it's like if you're bottling it up and you have this issue and you hold up. Yeah, then ego and you start to make assumptions, you know, they're out to get me. They're trying to make me miserable versus an ongoing communication. You bring it up relatively quickly, then it doesn't fester to really think about that. Because uh, another thing I found that was really powerful when Gottman talks about love maps, you know, that issue of getting to know your partner better, that gets a lot of, you know, quick talk. Oh, get to know your partner better. But I thought he framed it really well in the issue of, Yeah, knowing how your partner likes their coffee or knowing what your partner's favorite vacation destination is, that's nice. But asking bigger, harder questions like, what is your definition of love? What is a good husband to you? What is a good wife to you? What is what does marriage mean to you? Those are questions that are the the answers are idiosyncratic and personal. There, There are no like kind of set. There's some things we can agree on, but there are no set answers. Those are very personal. And it kind of gets you the answers to the test. I think it reveals a lot of, oh, that's why my partner is getting so bent out of shape about this little thing. Because to them, it's not little. And there's no book that's going to tell you your partner's idiosyncratic you know, feelings on what love means, what marriage means. You have to ask them. And by doing that, then you can start to say, okay, maybe handle this in this way, or maybe raise this issue in this way. And it becomes a lot easier when you realize, oh, they have a phobia about this. I don't need to scream and yell. I know they have a phobia about this. I can just kind of politely remind them. Oh, this is this is really great advice. Like in the research you you looked into in this book, how much did you look at the role of physical attraction and how that can blind us from really good getting into good relationships uh, have you looked into physical attraction at all and it's uh i don't really know what i'm asking <laughs> yeah no, no oh no 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 man i no that that was the trickiest thing what was really funny for me was in writing the book writing the love section was daunting because there's so much research I and mean, you can mm-hmm. get a great amount from gottman but there's a lot of research and so you kind of have to put boundaries on it because you you, you can't cover it or that would just become the book it would be a love book. And then what was funny was I was like, oh, good. I got through all this. And then the friendship issue is there's not a lot of research on friendship. So I ended up with the total opposite mm. problem, which is that, you know, we, we pay for marriage counselors. Marriage is an institution. You know, friendship, there's no business around friendship. There's no institution backing friendship's interests. So it was really interesting for me. But for love, I kind of had to put boundaries on it because otherwise it would have become the mm. book. And with physical attraction, now you're also getting into issues of it's a lot less one size fits all. What do women find attractive in men? What do men find attractive in women? What do men find attractive in men? What do women find attractive in in women? It's like now the permutations start to increase exponentially and trying to handle all that. The scope would have increased, uh, you know, uh, beyond beyond the bounds of a reasonable book. No, that's totally fair. That's totally fair. I just. I just feel like uh, so many of us jump into relationships because we're physically attracted to someone and then it it dissipates the, uh, after a couple of weeks <laughs> and then we're like stuck with the person. No, I mean, that's that's why basically I framed that section of the book around like, how do you make love? How do you make a marriage last? How do you make love last? So I, I didn't talk as much about the issues of attraction as what what sustains this in a healthy way. No, that's great. That's really great. Have you read uh, Carlin Fora's book, Friend Affluence? Oh, I and, uh, cited it and leaned on it heavily. She did a great job, a f- fantastic job of rounding up, you know, the existing research uh, on friendship. It's one of the few really good research-based books uh, on friendship. I interviewed her. I was number, that book's probably like almost 10 years old. 
Um, I I interviewed her the way back. I mean, because she did a phenomenal job. I agree. I agree. Let's dive into the friendship research a little bit. One of the interesting findings is that not being open and vulnerable doesn't just kill friendships, but it can also kill you. Can you talk a little bit more about uh, the, the value of openness and vulnerability? It's really critical. That's work by Robert Garfield at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, mm-hmm. where where I attended, where you taught. Um, the uh, yeah, no, I mean it's great. very critical in terms of actually many aspects. Because the first thing I did, playing my usual MythBusters angle, was to look at Dale Carnegie, you know, and Dale Carnegie's stuff on Friends. He wrote it before the advent of most social science research. Truth is, most of it holds up. Carnegie was very focused more on business contacts and more on the initiation of relationships. So I wanted to dive deeper and kind of see what sustains relationships or what deepens them or what produces close friends, best friends. And what the research pointed to was two things, was time and vulnerability. And the key thing being the issue of costly signals. It's easy to bob your head, pay compliments, find similarity. And that's, that, those are useful things for people. Those are useful things for con artists. That produces you know, much more shallow connection. To deepen it, time is always limited. It's always scarce. Spending a lot of time with somebody sh- over a long period of time shows they matter. It's a really critical thing. It's also the thing that friends fight over the most. And the other thing is vulnerability. Very simply, if I tell you things that could be used against me, if I tell you things that make me look bad, that is a very powerful demonstration of trust. It's not a casual, oh, I trust you. Here's a metaphorical weapon that you could use against me. I trust you not to. That sends a powerful signal of trust. And often, if the other person feels the same way about you, they reciprocate. And this is work by Daniel Hushka, where it's like that basically putting yourself out there, you know, to, you know, being vulnerable, they reciprocate and you escalate that vulnerability. That's what deepens friendships. I mean, you look at Jeff's, Jeff Hall's work, you see on average in typical relationships, it takes an enormous amount of time to create, you know, a deep friendship, you know, like th- for dozens of hours for a close friend and over 100 hours for the highest level of friends. But, you know, Arthur Aaron managed to make people feel like lifelong friends in 45 minutes by having people ask deeper questions, having people go back and forth. That vulnerability is a good litmus test for who who you care about, who cares about you. It is powerful in terms of deepening it. But to to your initial point, if we don't have it, that's where you get into the area of loneliness again, where our friends can't know us, can't help us, can't feel close to us if we don't share those things. And, you know, in the book, I posit the scary rule. If it's scary, say it. You can be incremental about it, but we need to share those difficult things. It's good for us. It's good for our friends and it's good for the friendship overall. Trust is so important for a friendship, yeah. for well, any relationship, really. And uh, by being vulnerable with someone, you're, you're signaling that you trust them. Not to tell your secrets. In terms of all the factors that are health related that can kill you, what are the biggest predictors and which are the ones that maybe we think uh, are big predictors but are not as big predictors? Um, you could talk a little about Robin Dunbar's uh, work a little bit. Oh, yeah. Like, I mean, that was that, that was not only insightful and impactful, but it, he was also pretty funny about it. Uh, Robin Dunbar teaches at Oxford, who, you know, famous for the Dunbar number. Can you explain what the Dunbar number is actually? Yeah, basically, he found that there are consistencies in terms of our social circles and how many people we can feel close to. Most people are familiar with Dunbar number in terms of this like hard stop on how big, you know, groups can be like in the workplace, military units, etc. And you see a shocking consistency over how well those match over time. If you go deeper into his research, you know, he talks about kind of the hierarchy where it's like, how many close friends can we have? How many semi, semi-close friends? How many acquaintances can we have? That we're, it almost seems like we are programmed at a certain level to have certain, only be this many close to this many people, less close to this many people, that they're sort of slots. And that also aligns with the work that shows after seven years, 50% of close friends aren't close friends anymore. That basically as, as new people you know, move in, 
you only have so many slots. As new people move in, other people have to move out. And so Dunbar, it's it's really critical to see that to see that we do seem almost wired for a certain number of people to be close to us at a certain level. But what he found health wise was mind blowing because he looked at all of the factors in terms of in terms of health and said specifically one year after a heart attack what determines whether you'll be alive or not and he found that really uh, it came down to two things and that was whether you smoke and how many friends you have now granted nutrition exercise all those things do matter but the the gap between smoking you know close friends and everything else he jokingly said oh you, you can slob about you don't have to get off the couch but like don't smoke and have a number of close friends which was also interesting because the bulk of the research shows that quality of friendships ma- matters more than quantity. But Dunbar also found that, you know, to a, to a degree, quantity matters as well. Cool. Really, really important work. A 2010 study of over 14,000 college students found that a 40% decline in empathy over the past few decades. While a separate study found scores in the Narcissism Personality Index increased by almost 50% between 1990 and 2006 among a similar cohort. Uh, what 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 is the takeaway? What what do you what do you get from that? The issue becoming part of that is due to our increase in parasocial relationships. I mean, you start with you know you start with the work of Robert Putnam. You know, end of the twentieth century, we saw the decline of community in the in almost every sphere. We saw a decline of community interactions. We, we if we think about like the Elk Lodge or bowling leagues, it that almost seems archaic to us, but the community kind of declined. And he attributed the bulk of those shifts to television, you know, television providing these pseudo parasocial relationships. And now in the 21st century, you know, we have social media, we have online, you know, support, which is this weird thing where on one hand, it delivers some of the positive benefits, some of the connections, but it doesn't deliver some of the others. And we have this human innate ability to be Efficient would be the uh, would be the uh, the polite spin on it, but we can also be lazy, and it's easier to turn. You can turn on the TV, turn off the TV. You can turn on Instagram, turn off Instagram whenever you want. Instagram doesn't ask you to borrow money. You know, it's 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 a lot easier. You can have you know relationships at your convenience, and that has kind of encroached on those deeper connections, face to face connections. We all kind of get. A past during the pandemic. But these trends are, are pretty clear that, you know, hey, if I can get some of the friendship benefits, but not the costs and difficulties of the lazy end of, of, our, of our brains is kind of saying, oh, hey, maybe that sounds like a better deal. And we're seeing this and it's, it's bad. We're getting a level of self-absorption. You, you, you see that there's an increasing focus on popularity, on status over likability, which aren't well correlated. Most people who are very popular are not very likable, you know, and it's really challenging for us. And you see this level of self-absorption, but, you know, as, as, uh, as Sherry Turkle found, you know, when these kids, some of the same kids show up, when they go to camp and their phones are taken away, empathy levels return to normal. So, you know, it is that issue of social media is not an unadulterated evil. Uh, it's just that it can encroach on the limited amount of social time we have every day. Do you really think like prior generations really weren't narcissistic when you compare different generations to each other? Like, I feel like every older generation is like, oh, the kids these days are, are so narcissistic. Like in the 60s, I bet parents were saying that about the children. I feel like we always in every generation, we have something in our culture that is that makes the young kids. There's something programmed about young kids being narcissistic in general. I think that's totally true. I think it's I think it's both. I mean, every older generation is critical of the younger generation because they're not exactly like them and because different phases of life. Babies are very selfish, but they don't have a choice not to be. You know, it's an issue of survival. They 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 need us. And and young people are trying to find their way in the world. They're they still have to define their personality, they still have to define their role and place in the world. So that means they're gonna be a little bit more self-focused. However, We've never had this little community because before community meant survival. You couldn't exist on your own for the vast majority of human existence. And you didn't have the ability to opt out and live. You know, now we have an extraordinary ability to opt out or at least to live at arm's length. You know, and I think you get a vicious, a vicious circle there where we we are able to keep that distance and that affects us emotionally. And we don't think as much about others' needs because we're not in that loop of being dependent upon them 
and then being dependent upon us, you can live a pretty independent life. But it doesn't necessarily have positive effects on our connections to others or how we feel in ourselves. I mean, when you look at the, mm. I talk about some of the MRI data that when people feel lonely, when they feel disconnected, their brains scan for threats twice as fast. You know, that's not a choice. That's just at a fundamental level. When you feel disconnected from others, your brain realizes, hey, I better be on the lookout for threats because help isn't coming if there's a problem. Wow. And again, that's not a choice. That's something that just happens. Again, that's it might be smart from a survival perspective in our ancestral environment, but it certainly isn't conducive to happiness, especially in the modern era. No. Here, here. Okay, so why is reading people's body language overrated? There is no Rosetta Stone for, for body language. We, we, we can never know why someone is doing, is doing something. If they're shivering, maybe they're nervous, maybe they're cold. You know, we, we don't necessarily know. And the other issue is that a lot of it's idiosyncratic. You know, somebody, you know, some people scratching their face might mean they're nervous and lying and other people, it might be they're just itchy. So we don't know what particular signals for any individual mean a specific thing. By getting to know them better, you might get better. But the truth is, like Nicholas Epley's work at the University of Chicago, we're not good at reading the thoughts and feelings of, of others. You know, with strangers, we're about 20 percent accurate. With friends, we're 30 percent accurate and spouses peak at 35 percent. So whatever you think your spouse is thinking, two thirds of the time you're wrong. So we with body language, we're trying to make these associations. And, you know, again, unconsciously, we can read people, size people up pretty well. But trying to look at individual specific actions and attribute overall global motives and perspectives, that's really not our specialty. So it's it's better to hear someone than see them. Is there research on that? Yeah, this was this was dramatic you know, was the issue of they did studies where people, if you could see someone but couldn't hear them, empathic accuracy dropped off enormously. But when you could listen to someone but not see them, you know, it's like we still, it, it only dropped off mildly. So, I mean, this is, this is good news for podcasts. But, you know, it's like we hearing somebody actually delivers a lot more information than seeing someone. Again, because we're really not that good at, at reading those intricacies of, of body language in the moment. That just blows my mind, that, that discrepancy. So the drop off is 54% when you can I, see I someone but was, not hear them. Yeah. It was something like that. Yeah. What are the implications for like interviews for orchestra auditions? There are there deep implications here for lots of things in life? Uh, potentially. I mean, well, job interviews as we usually perform them are, are Terribly fraught anyway. I mean, the primary issue, the one of the best ways the research has shown to improve job interviews is to make them structured and, form and formalized because people vary dramatically in what questions they ask to one candidate versus another candidate. So then all of a sudden it, it moves completely out of the bounds of like getting legit information and more of that issue of do you feel rapport with this person? And rapport is not necessarily predictive of job performance. Um, so, you know, it's really critical in job interviews that we think about, you know, that issue of structure. But it's also critical to, to think about the job at hand. You know, if you're evaluating someone who's going to be coding and writing software, their ability to, you know, present themselves in an interview may have very low correlation with like how well they perform their job. Meanwhile, sales professional, their ability to interact with others might be critical to the profession. So there's this varying scale, but we kind of use a very similar system for everybody. And I, I don't I don't know if this one size fits all approach is is necessarily the best way to determine who's going to be awesome at a job. I agree. Um, so what 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 can you do if you want to catch a liar? I mean, this was something that I, I found fascinating because, again, Mythbusters, so much of what we believe is, is wrong. We usually look for signs of anxiety, and that's not the case. We usually look for body language, body language, out of reach. It's never been correlated. It's never been seen to show an association. You know, what's really critical when it comes to lies is that lies actually take a surprising amount of thought. 
you have to think about, you know, the truth. You have to think about the lie you're telling. You have to monitor the other person to see if they're catching on. They ask questions. You have to update your fictional story in real time. That requires a fair amount of brain power. So the best way to fundamentally, the best way to detect lies is to increase that cognitive load, is to make it even harder. They make them have to think more until, to use a computer metaphor, until the, the processor starts to slow down because it can't handle all of this. And specifically, what's very valuable is to ask unanticipated questions, is the issue of no liar can prepare for every question you might ask them. So to ask them something which they're not expecting, again, that's something that creates this big gap. It's very easy for a truth teller to answer. It's very difficult for a liar to answer. So the example I use is if you're a bartender and someone comes into the bar who's obviously underage, if you ask them, how old are you? They're going to say 21. They, they know the right answer. If you ask them, what year were you born? They probably didn't prepare for that. Now they're going to have to do math. And all of a sudden it's going to slow down. A truth teller knows what year they were born. So, you know, a liar might have to, oh, wait, I don't. And then now all of a sudden, again, it's not perfect, but it's a bigger improvement. Or That's when you clever. start to, oh, it's, it's very powerful. And now it was really funny. I was, I was in Prague uh, three weeks ago. And one of the research studies that I found on unanticipated questions was a study of airport screeners. And while I was in the airport in Prague, an airline attendant came up to me and said, hey, give a second. Can I ask you a couple of questions? And the questions were not direct. Oh, where are you going to? It was kind of like, so what did you do in your stay? So where did you, what did you, what, what did you do like yesterday? They were asking me these very kind of off. And I'm like, oh my God, like my research, the research, the research I was looking at the, for the book, like is actually being used on me. And it was so funny <laughs> to see, like I'm being subjected to this. And luckily I was telling the truth. So I had quick answers. But I could imagine that the number of the questions she asked me were not things that if I was lying, that I would have been able to produce in, in advance. If I was there doing a drug deal or something else I have to, versus I was easily able to say, I'm here for a wedding. It's my friend, Nick. You know, with the, 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 the event was at this location. It was at this time. You know, it was very easy. But I can imagine for somebody who's lying, it would have been much more difficult. Yeah, for sure. Well, Eric Barker. Um, I really appreciate you coming on my my podcast today, and and we covered quite a a wide range of ways in which you can play well with others within the romantic domain, within the friendship domain, and um, within even just being able to spot the bullshit of others. And so, <laughs> so I just I think it's a very comprehensive book, actually, uh, quite more comprehensive than than a lot of books on on the topic of connection. I want to leave with one last question, then. Um, in all in, the, in all these different domains you cover in your book, I mean, is there a thread that you see that kind of runs through all of them? Is there is there some sort of overarching transcendent takeaway about human connection that you can leave us with today? I did find a through line, and that is the the issue of stories. You know, when we are reading people or trying to read people, our brains are immediately within milliseconds starting to construct a story about this person. And then confirmation bias kicks in. And we have to be very careful to challenge those stories because we tell these stories about other people with very little information. And that can lead to biasing and stereotypes and on a higher level, but also on an individual level. And, and if we don't deal with people again, we, we get no chance to challenge the, that, that confirmation bias. And then, you know, in friendship, what I was amazed to find is that, you know, Aristotle said, friends are another self. And that actually proves to be true. You know, you have this, this Venn diagram overlap, this issue where when you interview people about their friends and you ask them, hey, is this quality true of you or true of your best friend? It will take them longer to answer. Because as we grow, grow closer to people, as we grow closer to friends, our ident in our minds, our identity and their identity overlaps. We tell ourselves the story that they are part of us. And in love, you know, like I said, Gottman's ability with 90 plus percent accuracy to predict whether a couple will be divorced in five years, he gets there by simply asking them, tell me your story is the critical thing. And for communities, you know, at large, is no man an island. Those, those, those issues, communities are built around a story, a story of connection. 
many of the stories that human beings have told themselves throughout history about how we're connected have not been factually true. But what they did do was they, they bound us together. They told us a story of, of connection and unity. And we need those stories. So throughout every aspect, the theme I found running through every aspect of the different types of relationships is it all comes down to the stories we tell ourselves. That's brilliant. Maybe that's where mindfulness can come in as well and helping us to be more mindful in the presence of others where we don't allow these automatic thoughts to uh, intrude and in, in what a, the, beauty of, the beauty of what a relationship could be. Our, our expectations get in the way sometimes. Absolutely. Eric, thank you so much. It was great, so great talking to you. And let's not let's not go another five years. <laughs> talking, talking. How's that sound? <laughs> that, that sounds that sounds fantastic. But thank you very much, Scott. It was it was really great to be here. Thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.